All right, so again, I'm Eleanor Hodges with EcoAction Arlington. I'm going to quickly run through um, an overview of our work as well as what's new for 2021. So EcoAction Arlington focuses its work on the following areas, advancing energy efficiency, increasing our tree canopy, reducing litter, engaging our community through education and advocacy, and preparing our student leaders of tomorrow. So some of our new and exciting announcements and programs that we're very pleased to highlight at our 43rd annual meeting. I'm gonna start with our Straw Free Arlington program. So with the mission of eliminating single use plastics in restaurants, we've been working in the restaurant uh, community to survey uh, close to 150 restaurants across Arlington. And we've published all of the information about these restaurant sustainability practices on our, practices on our website. The restaurant partners listed here excel in the areas of reducing their plastic and other sustainability efforts. So we're very pleased to recognize them. And tonight, as you've heard, we have uh, four restaurants that have chosen um, to provide special promotions. And here's a little bit more about some of the amazing things they are doing to promote sustainability. So it's everything from using um, compostable materials to uh, sourcing ingredients from sustainable farms and fisheries, to making sure that their uh, website has opportunities to uh, not get plastic utensils and to have discounts for bringing in your own mug. Next, I wanted to showcase the work that we are doing in advocacy. We launched a new advocacy committee in October in 2019. And these amazing uh, volunteers have been uh, very busy with the focus in the areas of zero waste, forestry and natural resources and the community energy plan implementation framework. Over the past um, six months, we worked hard uh, to educate the community about the opportunity to enact a plastic bag tax and we had a plastic bag petition, which we recently submitted to the county board, urging them to enact the new five cent plastic bag tax that was authorized by Governor Northam in April of 2020. We submitted 1,482 signatures, thanks to all of you who support this important um, opportunity to become um, part of the regional community and having plastic bag legislation. We also hope you'll check out our Eco Advocate, which comes out monthly and contains many, many information, much information about how you can get involved and take action on important local and Virginia policy efforts. The next new initiative is our new Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Just launched in December 2020, this committee is going to work to develop a justice and inclusion policy to guide our work to becoming actively anti-racist. Our board is um, proud of this work and extremely committed to making sure that we do a number of different initiatives to bring this throughout our, our organization, including providing diversity training for board and staff, helping to recruit diverse staff, board members, and committee members, and amplifying all of the diversity, equity, and inclusiveness actions of our organization. So now I just wanna run through kind of what's going on in 2021 and specifically how you can connect with our work. As many of you know, we have regular volunteer stewardship opportunities. Um, we do four public uh, stewardship projects a year. And we also offer opportunities for groups who wanna have a custom project of their own to help improve Arlington streams, parks, and waterways. Our next stewardship project is on Saturday, April 24th. In honor of Earth Day, we'll be holding an Earth Day cleanup in Bon Air Park. Other ways you can get involved are through our signature program that we run in partnership with the Virginia Cooperative Extension Energy Masters. Um, and you would participate in a training that will take place in the fall and then um, learn how you can reduce energy in homes and then apply that work to helping low income residents improve the energy efficiency of their home. So we will be offering the next training for this program in the fall of 2021. Another volunteer opportunity is our R4 Action Group. Uh, these are volunteers who are interested in helping contribute to projects to reduce waste in our Arlington community. 
And we've been working on a number of different areas, including um, educating the Arlington public school community, looking at how we can reduce waste at special events back when we had special events. And this is the group that oversees our straw free Arlington program. Uh, this group meets on the first Wednesday evening of each month and we welcome newcomers, so please join us. We have several um, opportunities um, in partnership with Arlington County to take um, green action in your own home. And one of the um, best ones is the Arlington Solar and EV Charging, EV Charging Co-op, which uh, we participate in in partnership with Solar United Neighbors of Virginia and AIR in Arlington County. And this is an opportunity to go solar as part of a group, uh, save money and have some fellow uh, group members to help navigate uh, the solar process. And then uh, we work in partnership with Arlington County to administer the Arlington County Tree Canopy Fund. Uh, two times a year, property owners in Arlington can apply for free trees planted on their property. Um, and these are free native trees. They're typically about two inch, uh, pretty large eight to 10 feet foot trees typically. And it's a great opportunity if you have space and wanna help uh, contribute to increasing Arlington's tree canopy as well as all the other amazing environmental benefits that trees provide. The next opportunity for the tree canopy fund will be to apply in mid June for trees to be planted in the fall of 2021. So uh, now I'm gonna run through kind of what's happening um, over the spring and, and ways you can connect with us. Uh, so starting in October, we launched our Love Our Living World series and we are planning a series of five events. Um, so the third event in the series will be Sunday, March 21st and it will be a sip and paint. So this will be an active opportunity to uh, work with the artist Kelly Sansone and paint and sip um, a beverage of your choice and it will be taking place from 5 to 7 p.m. For all of our events, you can sign up on our website. The fourth event in the Love Our Living World series will be Biophilia in Your Community, scheduled for Wednesday, April 14th. Um, the theme of this program will be a conversation about our food, gardening, communities, and creating sustainable landscapes. And we've got two amazing speakers lined up. Uh, Jeanette and Coma Say, who is a, a professor at George Washington University and their Sustainable Landscapes Master's Program, and Carolyn Quinn, who runs Dug In Farms in the Northern Neck. So join us for this great conversation, um, talking about our food, um, how our food practices contribute to the health of ourselves, our communities, and our planet. And then we're excited to um, the fifth event and the finale of Lover Living World will be our third annual Eco Extravaganza celebration on Thursday, June 3rd, 2021. And we'll be holding this virtually and hopefully we'll see if we can also offer a small outdoor gathering as part of this event. So I have a couple acknowledgements to do before I pass the program on. Um, so first, um, I wanted to acknowledge, I just welcomed our new board of directors. I wanted to acknowledge four amazing board members who are leaving us. Um, so if um, any of these folks are here, I hope they can um, wave their hands or put up a reaction in the Zoom. Um, so we are very sad to have Amna Bibi, Al Larson, Joan McIntyre, and our student board member, Alexa Gramada. So thank you very much for your service and we will miss you. And then I also wanted to recognize that um, the Eco Action Arlington staff team is amazing. I couldn't do all of this work without them. And some of them are here tonight, but I wanted to um, provide everybody's names. So um, with us here tonight, if they can again wave, is um, Michelle Bianchi, our program and outreach assistant, Lydia Cole, our communications manager, and Jocelyn Gallatin, our program and administrative coordinator. So thank you so much to this amazing team. And then I also wanted to briefly mention the other two names that you might hear of in connection with our work, uh, Julia Paltseva, runs our tree canopy fund, and Stephanie Sow is our energy master's coordinator. And we're also pleased um, to have an intern uh, working with us from Justice High School in Fairfax, Shabina Khan. 
So thank you all very much. Um, and I'm now gonna pass it over to, is, well, we can see, is Matt here? Great, Jill. Uh, welcome everybody to the annual meeting. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Matt, we're very pleased to have you. And um, we, are, uh, we consider you a true friend of uh, Eco Action Arlington and of the local environment in Arlington. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to, uh, to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Jill, and um, thank you, Eleanor, and everyone who is here tonight. Um, I am um, thrilled to be with you, and it was very helpful um, to, in the midst of um, working so hard on vaccine distribution, to get to take a, a few minutes today and think about um, what we've done and what we need to do um, over the coming year locally, and I am also thrilled that I will get to um, listen in uh, to, to at least as much as I can of Alonso's presentation as well. Um, I have heard so many times of the legendary Alonso. So I don't wanna put pressure on you for your remarks, but I did wanna um, be honest about everyone who has raved about your work and um, in a, in a post COVID, post vaccinated world, um, we will all want to uh, get to be together. Um, I'll uh, just, uh, I, I want to keep thoughts short, but I did put together just an inventory of what we are, what we have been working on. Um, and I really appreciate the chance to come on a little early to get to hear, to sort of connect the dots on the meetings that we've been having with respect to advocacy with EcoAction board members in the committee that um, Eleanor mentioned. So um, I, um, the, the mission of EcoAction of engaging uh, in public discussion and civic engagement uh, to help our government act um, just brought home to me the responsibility that we have um, as board members in this moment. So first, um, I'll just mention the plastic bag fee. Um, we did get the over 1,400, 1,482, um, I believe was the number of um, signatures on the petition. So um, two weeks, let's see, a week ago Thursday, so about nine days ago or so, uh, I guess maybe actually a week ago, I this issue came up in a Northern Virginia Regional Commission meeting and I spoke very strongly to try and move it forward. Um, Arlington is doing all that we can, but there is a state agency that has been charged with figuring out some of the finances. And so um, we sent a letter this past week um, pushing the state agency to take action. We, um, this is uh, all of the, the Fairfax, Prince William, we sent it on behalf of the Northern Virginia Regional Commission and there's a Fairfax commissioner. So we are seeking to get this moving as quickly as possible. We have a May 1 date, but we also have a couple of months needed in, to implement. Usually it happens quarter, it would happen quarterly. So we're pushing very hard. Um, look for an update either at the March board meeting or at the April board meeting where we would pass our staff knows that the entire board is, it wants to get this done as soon as we possibly can. And so uh, we may pass a resolution um, that gets that in writing to communicate to all of you who wrote in how, and we'll include some implementation in that resolution. But there's also eventually an ordinance and the ordinance is gonna have to address the finance issues that the state under the state legislation um, has to sort out. So that's just an example of the details of continuing to push relentlessly are really important and we're going to work on it. Um, we will do it as soon as we possibly can and we're pushing the state to get through the bureaucracy so that we can do this. Um, so that's on plastic bag. Um, I want to talk about the community energy plan implementation framework. Um, we have a, a letter from you from February 9th, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the framework and implementation is the key to reaching the high goals that we set uh, for 2035, 100% renewable electricity and for 
2050 uh, zero carbon. Um, so net energy zero, we have to, we have work to do um, to reach those goals and we're gonna need to have, uh, we have about over 60 in the staff's current draft of steps we need to take. We need to prioritize those 60 and put timelines on them. And so we're working on that. And I hope that I'm, we are going to do that by the end of this year. And I hope that we have the two rounds of consideration necessary to do it. Third, I'll talk about um, the green building policy, which we made significant progress on. Um, I think your advocacy committee can probably attest that, um, you know, several of us wanted to take all the steps that we could. We moved from lead silver to lead gold. Um, there's an all now article a, a bit ago that describes the success that we've had, but net zero is the standard we want to reach. Um, that it was not a, a standard that our staff and the board quite felt that we could reach at this moment, but we did put automatic updates beyond lead gold in the plan and we put a requirement that within three years, and this is what one thing that Takas and I really pushed for, that there would be a further update. So that's critical because we know uh, just in looking over 50% of our energy usage is from buildings. And so we have uh, a lot of steps to do there. And there are, in addition to that lead gold standard that is sort of a um, it's an opt-in program because we still have steps to do with the state of Virginia, but um, beyond that, there's net energy zero built into increased density um, in that. So that's another um, important program that we, piece that we worked on. And I'll wrap up relatively quickly. Food waste recycling, um, surely on this call, um, I know that of the 147 of us, there's at least a few in a addition to all of us who care about it, but who this is a big issue. Um, we are taking the steps to implement this and um, credit and thanks goes for guidance a year ago that really pushed this to Katie Crystal. Um, but all of us support it and uh, it's proposed um, and I fully anticipate it will be adopted in our fiscal year 22 budget and implemented, um, I believe September 1st but it could be slightly before then. We will do it as quickly as we can. And so progress on that. Um, all of us uh, on the call probably grew up in a time when recycling meant glass recycling. And um, the market has changed for the better from a year ago on glass recycling. And our um, Arlingtonians are stepping up huge as I kind of would anticipate um, to recycle glass and we have a clean stream there that is now profitable. So I would um, suggest that um, perhaps not in this budget, I think that will be too much, but uh, over the coming year in this budget, we could add from five sites, perhaps to one or two additional. Um, but, uh, and then also in a, beyond that, um, I would wanna be considering uh, for the budget beyond that of whether we can. A couple of other issues, the legislature made huge project pro progress on electric vehicles and we have the solid waste plan before us. But I also see Jill there, which may mean it is time to hear the much anticipated Alonso. Um, I hope that gives you a sense of the detail and the commitment that I try to bring to the issues that EcoAction is all about. And uh, I'm grateful for all of you uh, and the work you do. Um, it, it's one of the five reasons I ran and it is with me almost every day. So thank you. Thank you so very much, Matt. It's really, uh, appreciate all of your work and especially during these, these very trying times. So thanks Matt for everything. Um, so I'm gonna turn the program over to uh, our board member, Chris um, Baumgartner, who's going to introduce Alonzo and then also moderate the session of the questions and answers. So thank you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, and I just lost my little notes. So give me one second. And Matt, thank you for participating. I really appreciate your notes. 
Um, I think Matt was accurate in his description of Alonso. He's legendary. Um, he's a, an Arlington treasure that uh, we we're very fortunate to have. He's a well-known local naturalist, an environmental educator and storyteller. Um, he's a natural resources manager for the Department of Parks and Recreation, co-chair of the Beltway Chapter of Region 2, the National Association of Interpretation. He's also a trained master gardener. Uh, he was made an honorary Virginia master naturalist in his role in starting two chapters and serves uh, as an instructor for both. Uh, he's the co-founder of Washington Area Butterfly Club and has held uh, a number of offices, including president of the Potomac chapter of the Virginia Native Plant Society. Uh, it is a, a total pleasure to introduce Alonzo. Uh, he's got a, a wonderful video of, again, another Arlington treasure that we have here uh, that I only recently found out about. So if you're not familiar with it, I, I, I think you're in for a treat. Yeah, so first, before Alonzo comes on, we're going to show the video. <laughs> so. Perfect. And okay, yeah. And one, one quick note, just from a, a process standpoint, um, I'm going to do my best to moderate uh, the, the questions that come in. Uh, if you're familiar with the chat feature, uh, please do your best to just put a put a question in the chat. When we get to the Q&A section, instead of unmuting everyone and accidentally having people talk over top of each other, I'm just going to read through the questions and ask Alonso. So uh, thank you for your, very much. And uh, without further ado, over to you, Alonso, and to the video. Well, thank you. And yeah. again, I'm, I'm very honored that you guys have uh, asked me to come and speak to you and so forth. What I plan to do is to give you a quick little summary, uh, an overview of some of the things that we here in Arlington we do uh, with parks. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, it, it will probably you know, raise a lot of questions from you, and that's a good thing. But uh, again, uh, this is obviously a very incomplete uh, summary, but it's enough at least to, to let you have an idea of some of the stuff that's going on. Uh, as part of it, I'll also tell you a little bit about some of the things that you may be able to do to assist, I guess, the natural environment in, Ireland, uh, in Arlington as well. So hopefully I can share the screen and we'll see if this works. So. So if hopefully you guys can see that, I hope. I can't. Can you guys see that? I'm, I'm hoping you can. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great, great, great. Yes. Okay, great. good. All right. So uh, again, uh, I, again, the, the whole, this is again about Arlington's natural treasures and I'm hoping that I'll be able to tell you some of the protection efforts that we do to it. So when you look at Arlington, if you look at the left-hand side here of, uh, of the screen, you'll see that it, it doesn't look as promising as you'd like. I mean, uh, we're not a big county, um, but we have a very large population. But unfortunately, we end up with something like 40% impervious surfaces. We've lost about 50% of our surface streams. There is just a whole list of different things. We're down to 4.4% natural lands out of, you know, out of, the, the lands that we still have left. There's a great degree of soil disturbances. Many of our plants are locally rare. About half the animals are, are, are extirpated and no longer exist or have been undocumented. And the same thing with the reptiles and amphibians. But having said that, um, if you look over on the right hand side, we have a lot of neat things to kind of uh, to mention as well. As you can see, um, we have some great treasures up above as far as some of the things that have been uh, that we've already noticed and have listed. And some of these we're still trying to explore. So for example, the number of mods, we just started looking at that just just a couple of years ago. So that will doubtlessly go up. Within those, uh, within the, the plants that we have, 13, uh, uh, 13 of the uh, plants are state rare. And so we're, we're quite lucky that they still exist and that we are able to protect them. We have one globally rare, um, a globally rare uh, community, and uh, that's part of the video that's going to be played later, and I'll mention it today. And several state rare communities are also found within Arlington. Now, because of some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years, and again, you got to remember, I've been with the county for 25 years now, um, and I'll tell you, the difference that I see from before to now is amazing. And because some of the good work the parks have done and things like that, we see lots of the animals and wildlife also responding to that. So all of a sudden we have ravens that are nesting here. We, for a while there with the first uh, natural resource management plan, there were no 
skunks. And where was like, how could there not be any skunks? But now I will say there are several videos and so forth of skunks that we have found. River otters returned, coyotes have moved in, bobcats have moved in, and a whole slew of other types of things that you can see here. Yellow crown night herons, uh, Mississippi kites are nesting here. Wild turkeys now have made the paper several times as they've come up uh, into our area. And we've rediscovered some things which had disappeared. So folks, um, I did want to say that we, we do have a plan for what we're doing. And even though the numbers on the left don't look as good, and as I go here, if you look at the total number of uh, natural lands we have left, um, you know, there's only seven, 738 acres of natural lands that, have, that are left inside Arlington. Of that, the county only, uh, only manages 248 acres, okay? And so it doesn't look like we have a lot there, but in reality, we still have some hidden treasures and we're doing our best to preserve the little bit we have left in the best way possible. And we count uh, all of you as partners in trying to get this done. So if you look at our natural resources unit, which is the one that I had here for Arlington, um, we have what we, we call basically our, our prime directive as it were. So basically it, it consists of protections, restoration efforts, our invasive program, management, and the engagement with the public, of which this presentation is kind of part of that. And we'll go into a little bit about each of those. But before we do, you have to realize that you can't really protect anything unless you know what you have. And so for about five years, the county went out there and started doing these uh, uh, natural uh, heritage inventory. We basically went through and looked at what we had. And we did that in all sorts of different ways. We looked at the waters. We looked at the, at the animals that are there. We had volunteers help us. We contracted out uh, to, to for some professionals, especially botanists to help us have, have what we have there. And once we knew, what we had and where it was distributed, that gave us a much better idea of what we needed to do in order to protect it. So part of this, again, comes to one of the things that we do, and that's the protection and planning aspect of what we do. And so we do have a natural resource management plan, and that is right now currently being um, updated. And uh, over the next year, there will be uh, lots of opportunities for public engagement and so forth that you can come in and you can tell us a little bit about what about which different things we need to do, what things we've done well, what things we need to improve on, and there will be opportunities uh, present for that. Um, so that's something that's in the works now and you'll be able to know a little bit more about that as I, as I continue on. Um, part of part of our duties that we review the different county projects, uh, things come through when we try to mitigate whatever types of things they may be doing to make it better for the environment. Um, we do approve, uh, for example, the planting plants on, on, on county parks. So if somebody wants to plant something, uh, we have to review it as an invasive. If not, it's not going to get planted. Is it native? We have a native plant preferred planting policy, and that's what we go for because that supports the most wildlife. Um, so we do have some of that, and that's part of our, of our thing is to review of plants. Uh, we also have seven natural resource conservation areas, the best of the best, and Barcroft, the thing that will be that you'll you'll see see later on as one of the um, as one of the videos, is just one of them. And so we've protected these things, have special protections, and uh, and we're very careful about how we manage these very very dear uh, habitat portions that we now have left. We also have what's called a rapid environmental impact review. So um, basically, uh, we've gone through and have identified. Uh, something it's a something like 206 or so what we consider significant natural features they can be trees they can be wildlife populations they can be springs they can be geo ge geologic features and these are protected with a hundred foot barrier um, not a barrier I should say but uh, they're protected a hundred feet out that if anyone is trying to do anything near them um, they would have to uh, get approval to do that to make sure that they don't hurt what's there so um, if somebody comes too close to one of these different kinds of areas that um, automatically springs up this review and we have to go and make sure that we can uh, try to mitigate, make sure that what we're doing uh, won't hurt, uh, the, you know, the significant natural feature we have there. So this is just some of the things that we do. So here is a natural resource management plan, the one that's being currently developed. And it originally proposed 19 primary recommendations, some at high priority and some much lower. Of those, we've pretty much completed or have started on many of them. So many of them are ongoing. You can never finish them. For example, education. We're always going to do education, so that's never going to get done. It just continues to go. But um, but these are 19 basic um, recommendations that we tried to work on to make uh, to make uh, natural resources protect them better. 
Now, one of the other aspects that we do is restoration and habitat creation. And I will say some of it, is, some of it includes artificial stuff. You look on the top left corner and you see we, we have and we work with lots of different scouts and things like that to put up uh, uh, bee boxes, flying squirrel boxes, owl boxes, bird boxes, all of these kinds of things. And that's one of the things that we do. We also put up temporary wetlands, as you can see down in the middle, and we'll talk more about that later. We work on controlling invasives. And of course, we plant a ton of different native plants. Um, so if you look, um, so we look at Arlington County, again, you got to remember, it's, it's a small place, one of four of the smallest counties in the country. But as a, but this again, from the original natural resource management plan, as a testament to the historical richness and diversity of the native local flora, approximately 28% of the known naturally occurring species in Virginia were once found within the, boundary, the boundaries of Arlington County. We were and remain a, a very uh, important place with great biodiversity. And, and it all starts with the plants and continues from there. And so, you know, we, we do a lot of type of work uh, uh, with restoration plantings and things like to bring back and restore some of the things that were here before so that it'll continue to support habitat. But again, a very rich place uh, for a lot of different reasons why Arlington is, was such a rich place um, here in the county and, and could support so many different kinds of native flora. So some of the things that we do um, include this kind of thing. I mean, we, we, we plan meadows, we, are, we do monarch way stations and other pollinator patches, and we have worked on, on recommending some of these living shorelines. Now, many of these things are not things that we ourselves always do. It's things, for example, uh, the living shoreline, the middle piece up in the middle, um, uh, up at the top here. Um, that is something that, um, you know, we had a voice in trying to do this and the living shoreline basically buffers the area and replants with native plants and it becomes a much better habitat, much nicer to look at than the riprap which we normally see in some of our, uh, some of our places. Um, we also work with different partners in the top left, we work the Dominion Energy to put together a pollinator patch, uh, which is active and, and a beautiful, uh, a beautiful patch that, that continues all the, that really, um, uh, really attracts all sorts of different kinds of pollinators. Um, we also work uh, as staff. So for example, over here, um, you see with the Monarch Way Station sign on there, um, we have yearly events. And this is something that all county staff come in and help us to replant, in this case, this neat little meadow uh, on the entrance to Long Branch Nature Center, which again, supports a ton of different kinds of things. That when we did this, there were 42 different kinds of plants that we, that we, uh, that we put in in this particular planting itself. You look down below, and we'll talk more about this later, but we're on a few places where, um, where an actual uh, a practice field was actually decommissioned and is now being converted into an active uh, meadow, and you can see that below. And on the right-hand side, on top right, um, here we also uh, work in what's called a PRISM, Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. And this with other jurisdictions, we partner together to do these kinds of things. And this is one of the, one of the things that, have, that has come from them. Along the WND, we were able to, to plant all of these neat kinds of things. And now with conjunction with our partners, I know that some people may have noticed some of the work the Dominion's been doing, uh, doing a lot across there. And unfortunately, you know, trees are not compatible with power lines, but that does mean that that means that we don't have to compete uh, for canopy goals. We know that since trees are not allowed to grow there, it can make for a great meadow type of, of, of habitat. And that's what we're trying to work with and so forth. So in order to do that, we started a native plant nursery, I guess maybe four years ago. Um, it's very much volunteer led and so forth. And as an example, um, here in, in 2019, we, we, uh, you know, we propagated 7,200 different plants. We bought some more. They're all local ecotype. These are all native plants. They're all things that, um, that grew naturally here. We, we don't reinvent something. A restoration planting means to restore something. You don't invent a garden. This is not how it works. But we have this, uh, we have this native plant nursery and we completely depend on volunteers. And I will say with the coronavirus and so forth, we weren't able to do a lot of the different kinds of plantings that we had wanted to do. But again, this is, a, this is a wonderful type of thing. And we're one of the few counties that has a native plant nursery that we can depend on so that we can look and plant some of the rarer plants. We can plant some of the common ones, which are, which are commonplace that we need to be in all the different plantings. 
This is something that we do. And thank goodness that we have this native plant nursery largely supported by many of the volunteers to help out. And again, there will be an opportunity, for example, if you guys wanted to help and join us in, in some of our nursery events. So again, um, uh, with the county board, they signed on to the mayor's monarch pledge. And um, this was, uh, I guess this will be maybe going on our third year now that we're part of the mayor's monarch pledge. And uh, basically there were 25 different things that you could do in order to support monarchs. And of those, uh, we've, we've committed to doing 18 of them. And so we're an elite, um, we're in the elite category of counties that actually do this as far as the monarch pledge. And again, it's a wonderful type of thing and we include include different types of milkweeds and things like that in many of the plantings that we do. We propagate, again, just this past year, we propagated over 300 different milkweed plantings, um, plants in our nursery that we put out there. So again, um, this is just one more commitment that the, that the county has done and we report back to them as far as what kinds of things we're doing uh, as, as part of our yearly reports, but we are again an elite member as part of the Mayor's Monarch Pledge. Um, the other big thing has to do with invasive plant management. And again, going again from the Natural Resource Management Plan, invasive plants, uh, invasive plant species represent the greatest and most immediate threat to the continued survival of Arlington's natural lands and native plant communities. Because a lot of people might see something and it's green and they think, oh, that's a good thing, but it's not. In, and unfortunately, invasive plants, um, they, 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 um, they take up the place that native plants could go and then sup don't support anywhere near what native plant communities can. And so it's very important to control these invasives that go out of, con that, that, uh, that go out of control and, and um, compete with them. Some of them actively uh, grow over and kill some of our native plants. And so we have a very, um, we have an invasive plant management program. We have a rolling 10 year plan that's looked at every couple of years in order to, to look at it uh, as far as where we apply some of this. Um, it, we, it, we have about $110,000 that, that has been committed to, um, to doing this. Um, and again, we do this in a variety of different ways. Staff do it, volunteers we depend on quite a bit, and we do a contract, some of it out to certified, uh, I guess, um, invasive plant uh, contractors that can actually um, can, can actually control some of these things. And we don't, uh, we do it in a bunch, bunch of different ways, whether mechanically or recitally. We use a lot of different kinds of methods. As a matter of fact, um, we're, we're part of a study that's starting just next week of looking for alternate main, main ways of controlling invasives. And we're, we're one, of the, one of the counties that's part of this plan. So again, if you wanted to volunteer and do things, every weekend we've got some remove invasive plants or RIP programs that are run by volunteers and people can come in and do these kinds of stuff. And so there is a ton of different kinds of ways that you can help, but invasives is one of the big parts of our program. Why? Because it may look green, but unfortunately does not support wildlife and in fact actually hinders a lot of it. So it's very important that you get invasives under control or you basically lose, um, lose what, what value uh, your parks really have as far as wildlife is concerned. And again, we're also, as I mentioned, members of a PRISM. So again, we're, we got, we're members with other jurisdictions and sharing information and trying to work together to control invasives. So some of it also includes this. This is a temporary pool. You can see we've put up this, these little barriers up on here. They fill up with, uh, the, when the water hits them, they fill up and they form a temporary pool. And in doing this, we've returned so many neat um, amphibians. We give them a temporary place where they can breed and so forth. It's, it's incredible how these things have worked for us. And in one case, we introdu reintroduced just, uh, four, uh, just four frogs that were mating into one little area. And now if you go back there to this park, there are well over 200 of them singing every spring. Why? Because we supplied the habitat, we controlled the invasives, so they had something that these frogs could eat, the insects that were feeding on these plants, and that we protected the area, and now we have all of this. We've returned something back, uh, back to this. Um, so here are some of the things that are the, the that make use of these vernal pools. You can see on the left-hand side, the wood frog egg masses. Some people may have noticed in the last week, the wood frogs are going crazy in some of our ponds. Why? Because we protect them and so forth. And, um, you know, each, each pond, you know, one pond, for example, people may be familiar with Long Branch. Uh, the last count just of last week, there were 180 egg masses in just one, po in one pond. And since each egg mass can contain up to 300 or so eggs, it's a huge amount of things which are being protected 
reproduce in these vernal pools. Then we have spotted salamanders and the spring peepers just started singing. They will be singing uh, all the way through April. And again, we're supplying we're supplying habitat for these. We also put some artificial types of things that help us with studies and also provide habitat. So this is a, a wildlife study board, what some people call a snake board, because yes, if you lift it up on, an, on the right hand side, it's hard to see. But in this under this one little board, there were seven snakes, two different species, plus a lizard all hiding underneath this one snake board. And that helps us to study and find out what we have there. It helps us provide habitat to these different kinds of animals. So it's, it's a pretty neat uh, type of thing. And it's just one of the neat things that we do. We set up these habitat boards as, a, as, a, as artificial cover for some of these things. So another thing is engagement. And again, I am talking to you guys, so that's part of it. But we lead walk or find people to lead walk. Um, we, we have lots of volunteer uh, efforts to try to do this. Uh, we have all sorts of different people are trained now to remove invasive plants as part of our RIP program um, for controlling invasives. Uh, we, we've been working with some of the different groups, including tree stewards and master naturalists, uh, for putting together a park stewards program in, in many of our parks. We do seed collecting and cleaning. Again, this is all some of the stuff that we do. And then some of it um, we can direct or help with, but it's really up to you. And a lot of this in includes citizen science, where the citizens are supplying the, the efforts and the, and, and the knowledge. Um, they go out there and they participate in these different kinds of things. And these are just some of the events of some of the stuff that we do. And this year, I invite you guys all to participate in this year's City Nature Challenge. It'll be from April 30th to May 3rd. You can download the free iNaturalist app. You take a picture of something. The app helps you identify it. You post it and everybody else kind of looks at it. And I will say uh, this year, I'd expect over 200 cities worldwide to participate in this. And um, we've been lucky in the last few years in the different categories of how many people participated and how many species and so forth. We've been in the top 10. And so we're part of Arlington as part of Washington, DC as part of the, the city that, that that's posted. But again, I invite you guys to go do that so that you can do your part. And we look at these things. We, we look at these things that people have discovered and that tells us where there's new invasives, that tells us when there's brand new species. This is all types of stuff where the citizens supply some of the knowledge that can supply, that can help other people to, to do it. And in this case, it can help us directly. So um, we mentioned the, the magnolia bog and that's that's going to be the, the little, just short little video comes in there. And I will say the magnolia bog uh, did receive an honor to the Virginia Association of Counties. It received a, an award already. And again, the award was not really us, but it was due to the great volunteer work that different groups and so forth have done. And we're just caretakers of this, supporting the great efforts that, the, that, that, uh, that our neighbors, the citizens and so forth of Arlington have done. And again, this kind of looks at it as a snapshot of a Barcroft, one of this globally rare places where it was when they first discovered this, it was one of only 13 of these uh, bogs in the whole world. And now they discovered up to two dozen more. But again, you see all the rarities in here. Uh, Barcroft Park, and, and we'll talk about this in, in, in the little video, but it has very several significant trees, some county champions. There's some rare, um, the, the Needham Skipper, that's a rare butter, uh, a rare dragonfly was found in there. Um, there is a little mention of the little wood satyr. And again, it's it's great places. I, this is one of the places we build those temporary vernal pools. So there's a ton of new amphibians there. And thanks to it, we've got American woodcock, which just right now are performing their breeding flights, which is a neat thing to see if you've never seen it before. Um, this is a great place um, for all these different kinds of birds to come back. So again, this is uh, an example of the meadow, which was to be a practice field. And now it's, it's a fully functioning meadow with tons of great native species and supporting a ton of pollinators. And one of those things to support it was this. We, when we did the first inventory of the county, we were really surprised that this butterfly did not turn up. We're like, how could this butterfly, which is not rare, not turn up? But wouldn't you know it, after we ended up um, uh, putting in the native, uh, native grasses that the, the caterpillars need to feed on, it has reappeared again. And then this picture was taken right inside Barcroft Meadow of the first time I have ever noticed a little wood satyr um, again inside the county. So here are two other things. The yellow crowned night heron, again, um, the only place that's ever been seen is in Barcroft Bog. And again, it was seen in here. It's mostly a coastal type of thing, but it's there too because we supply the habitat. 
And another bird, this rusty blackbird, it, it's up to 70% of the population has disappeared. Um, they live up north, but this is an important place that they have to stop um, in order for them to be able to get, um, uh, it's a pit stop before they continue on their journey. And again, thanks to this, it's just another location that they can stop in before they're head on their long journey back up to the north. So an interesting story, and I'm going to talk about this, is we have, we, we do a lot of these things depending on different kinds of records and so forth. So way back when, there was this record that uh, of this fern, the Boots Wood Fern, uh, an interesting uh, combination of two native ferns, which rarely happens, but it's, it's, it's a very rare thing. But it was noted in 1895 in Pimmet Run. And thanks to one of our partners, uh, actually the, the ecologist from Alexandria, Rod Simmons, he actually noticed this and we went out, he noticed where it had been before, had heard records that it was still around. And wouldn't you know it, looking at the same records that we had before, it looks like the same colony of Boots Wood Fern is the exact same place that it was in 1885. It's, it's again survived. It's, 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 it's one of these rarities that somehow it survived in this one little area. And it's like that. We look at records. We try to restore things. We try to protect things once we find them. And Boots Wood Fern is just one example of that. So we also work with, uh, with uh, private landowners. So the Northern Red Salamander, that's the largest of the red salamers that we have in, 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 in the United States. Um, there is only one calling left in all of Arlington and it's on private property. And so we work with the private landowner. They allow us to come on, come in there to look at them, do some habitat manipulation in order to help this kind of thing. And again, it's a great partnership because it's even kind of an unofficial mascot uh, for this particular area. But the Northern Red Salamander, even though it's on private property, is something that we do take care of in, cooper in uh, collaboration with the landowners. So here is a neat little thing. So. Since 1977, this this uh, this salamander, the white spotted slimy salamander, had not been seen. Okay, I looked for it. I mean, I looked for it as part of the uh, of the reptile and amphibian studies that we were doing when we first the inventories. I never found one. But again, during one of this the city nature challenge, one of these uh, things that I'm asking if you guys participate, someone found one. And in this case, the one who found it, again, it was Luca Catanzaro who, uh, who found it. He is a, he's a high schooler and he found it, knew that it was a rarity, reported to us, reported to the state. And thanks to him, and again, he's not a professional, this is a high school student. He refound this great slimy salamander, something that it disappeared, we thought, and no longer exists, exists in the county. So folks, again, as far as professional naturalists and stuff like that, we don't have many of them, but we depend on volunteers, whether it's a master naturalist, a tree steward, a master gardener, whatever the case may be, echo action, we, we depend on you guys to help us out because we can't be there all the time, but you guys can. Every, the works that we try to do, we can only do them with support from you guys. And in this case, the interesting observations and the quick eye of, in this case, uh, uh, a teen who not only that, he's actually found three of them so far and we're protecting that little area where this particular salamander continues to exist. So, so yes. Just from a timing uh, standpoint, we got just a couple more minutes and then- okay. we'll Okay. Well, sure we have time for Q&A. So sure, sure. Again. Very good. So again, some things have come back, but don't really live in Arlington. Everyone's heard about the O'Connell black bear that walked through there. And this is a picture of that. Here was the skunk that, would, that we had thought no longer existed here, but we now know that it is. This is the exact same skunk that unfortunately was the first time we had seen it in Arlington. And it did spray the animal control officer to try to release it because it had fallen into a window well. But we know we have skunks now uh, and showed up in several videos. We found that the river otter, and this unfortunately is, is a roadkill, had gotten hit. But again, we worked closely with animal control. They reported to us, and now we know we have these river otters and that we, we have more than one now uh, that seems to go across into Alexandria as well. Same thing with that. Um, again, this was um, by Design Powers. They're the person, uh, they're the people who actually saw this. Again, we have visual proof. There's a video and lots of pictures that have provided that the bobcats have returned back to Arlington. The first time ever, the Mississippi kites had nested inside Arlington. The, the, on the left-hand side, you see the young one in the middle is, is, is the proud parent and a blue jay on the right who's not happy with it. Never had nested before, but now they are because we we're, we're provide enough of the insects that this, a, this animal needs to now survive. 
Now ravens are nesting across the Potomac. Again, didn't exist before, but now we have them nesting. Wild turkeys. This is one again taken here in Arlington as well, much as the last few pictures have been. And again, we, we've had lots of these things to turn up. Why? Because we're taking care of the habitat and things are, are coming back. So folks, uh, if you want to volunteer and things like that, I do invite you to check up our natural resources website. You can look up Arlington Environment and you can get to it. If you wanted to know more about volunteering, again, from there, you can go on the right-hand side and click on volunteer. You can volunteer at the nursery. You can volunteer RIP events. You can volunteer seed collecting. You can volunteer in a lot of different ways. So again, we depend on volunteers. I encourage you to do that. And then the last little thing, and again, if, if we're able to, I'd like to show you the picture. We do have game cameras. Here's just, just one family of foxes with their young here in Barcroft. So folks, I, I, will, I will go ahead and answer some questions now, but first some shameless self-promotion. Uh, in addition to my work with Arlington County, I'm also the Capital Naturalist. And if you're in social media on Facebook or, or whatever, I invite you to tag along with me and learn a little bit more about it. And that concludes a quick summary of what, of what we have going on. And I'm happy to answer whatever questions you might have. And if we have a chance to show the video and perhaps um, also show the, uh, the, the Fox video as well. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alonzo. Uh -huh. Those that are on video, a little uh, visual applause to Alonzo. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, I think from a blog stand or from the, the Magnolia blog standpoint, we're going to send out the video following this. Okay. Uh, we've, we managed to grab it, but uh, I think we'd want to reserve the remaining time to actually get some Q&A. So okay. I've got a couple questions that I'm just going to uh, similar to your presentation, rapid fire, throw them at you. Mm -hmm. um, so is there an overpopulation of deer in Arlington? And if so, how is Arlington dealing with it? Okay. So again, I, I can say from what I've seen that yes, the deer have definitely been more of them in the last few years. And I definitely have noticed that kind of thing. And anecdotally, I can say that other naturals and so forth have done that. We've noticed some of the things that might be going on. Um, so what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to do a survey again of how many deer are out there, what their distribution is, and to find out if that exceeds the, the, the biological carrying capacity of what the habitat can, can, uh, can support. If it can't, then we know that the deer are obviously hurting the environment and so forth. But again, we would first have to find out how many deer and what their distribution is. And that is one of the next steps that the county hopes to take is to find out how many deer and where they might be. Thank you. Uh, are there any plans for Arlington to, to start a chapter to join the Pollinator Alliance? I am not familiar actually with that, with that alliance or so forth, but I mean, we are members of a lot of different things already. And if it's something that we can do and so forth, um, we certainly would, in, would, invite, uh, would invite that. But we, you know, we, we already do a lot of different kinds of things for pollinators. One more thing, why not? And I think this was answered in, uh, in the chat, but uh, the native plant uh, nursery is at Barcroft Park. Um, additional question is, uh, Speaking of native plants, uh, when considering native plants uh, for the county, are we also considering those that are more hardy for climate change? Yes, yeah, so two different things about, about that. So yes, we have about 600 or so native plants that we know are, are, have been gone. There are 200 plants or so which are extirpated. They no longer exist here. And one of our thing is we're trying to return that. We've been trying, for example, to return some of these different guys, sure cane, plume grass, stuff like that. We're trying to return these back in there because when you return them, that supports all the wildlife that also, that, that also depended on them. Now, as far as, as hardiness and so forth, you gotta remember that just looking at here in the Northern Virginia area, there's over 1700 types of native plants. Some of them, for example, it would be unwise for us to plant. So for example, plants that are at the Southern limit of their range from the North. So those would not be a good idea to plant because we can assume that there will be global warming and so forth. And so we don't want to plant them. So things like sugar maples, things like that, not a good idea to plant. On the other hand, in my opinion, there are so many plants that are well within the range that we don't need to do any, um, I don't think, any time of, of migration of bringing 
things outside the range. Why do it when we have tons of native plants that are well within their range and even further south um, that could still supply the things rather than reinvent stuffing? Again, what I work in is restoration plant things. I restore things to what they what they should be. Um, I don't invent new things by bringing things from other places. That's not my role. I'm not going to second guess what Mother Nature did. I'm going to try to follow up and do the best I can to make sure that it heals the proper way. And so, um, yes, that is taken into account and so forth. And, and as far as I'm concerned, there are tons of different kinds of plants, 1,700 of them, minus a few that are the northern parts of the range that we could definitely use without having to do much more than that. And that's definitely taken into account on, on the different things that we do with plantings. Thank you. Uh, does the program, does your program review the removal of trees on a personal and on personal property as well as commercial property? Or is it just uh, limited to the county property? It's just county parks. I work with, with Arlington County Parks, and so it's just in county property. That, right. That's my, my thing with, with that. And, and again, I can't answer for foresters, but, uh, but again, there are, of course, different limitations and so forth of what you can and cannot do on private property. Thank you. We've got just amazing questions that are coming in. So uh, Vernal, uh, the Vernal pools, where are those located throughout the county? And uh, is it something that we can access or is it secret? Well, <laughs> I don't want to reveal, reveal all, but I'll tell you one of the places where we have it because it, it'll show up in the video when we do the video anyways. We do have some that we're very good about setting up and so forth in Barcroft Park. Now, again, uh, there, there are lots of things with amphibians and they're, they're very delicate and you don't want to mess with them or remove any of them. Um, there's, there's, very, there's very strict controls about moving amphibians from one place to another because there's two very fatal diseases, both chytrid and ranavirus, which will wipe out 100% of the population. When we move things, for example, we test them for those two types of diseases. So when we move something, we don't inadvertently introduce a disease that would wipe out every other amphibian we have in that area. So if you do see them and so forth, please watch them and so forth, but don't sample the water, don't go into the water where then you walk into some place you can spread the spores or whatever into a new area. So again, we do try to, to protect them as best we can. And sometimes I hate to say it, the best thing is to watch, but don't touch. And that's, you know, that's, that's part of it, I think here as well. Thanks Alonzo. And just to a few more minutes of questions. Uh, I have jotted all of these down, so perhaps we can have Alonzo send them out uh, in a follow-up email. Absolutely. The one that is uh, particularly of interest at the moment is uh, regarding the cicadas uh, <laughs> and their anticipated impact of this spring. Uh, any suggestions for uh, homeowners? Yes. Yeah, so, so there you go. And here's the thing. I did write a nice blog on this. It's on the Natural Resources website as long as, and as well as Capital Naturals. So yes, we will have a ton, billions of them that will arrive in mid-April, and then they'll pretty much be gone throughout May. By, 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 by June, they'll all pretty much be dead. Um, this, uh, so again, if you are planting something like that, uh, there are several things you, you need to keep in mind. First of all, they, uh, they won't affect anything but trees, okay? They don't feed on plants, ferns, anything like that, grasses, they don't. It's just trees. And again, as far as which trees, there are certain trees they don't touch. They don't touch evergreens, they don't touch sumacs, they don't touch any of those types of things. What they do look for would be pencil-sized little, little, um, little stems that they will then lay their eggs into. And those things basically, um, and they like the edges of woods where they get some sunlight. Most of the trees are six feet or more tall. So if you were here 17 years ago and they were, you had some problems with these things laying eggs in your trees and thus what they call flagging, causing some of the, the, the some of the dieback on some of the twigs, which is really just natural pruning. People, this has existed for millennia. It's not, they're not gonna kill the tree. A healthy tree is not gonna have any problem with this. But if you do want to take uh, take some precautions, then, don't uh, plant things perhaps this year until the following year. You can, I'm sorry, until the fall. You can do that. It's probably best to do that anyways. Um, and then you don't have to worry about these things impacting them. If you have some newly planted trees, you could try to protect them if you know that the, that the, that the cicadas will be in that area. Um, one, cent, one centimeter meshing will work, but you have to be careful because that can also catch birds and snakes and things like that. So um, it, it's, but in reality, a healthy plant does not 
it's not going to be harmed by the cicadas. It just doesn't happen. Um, and again, we'll, there will be a lot of programs and things like that on cicadas that are coming up. Our nature centers, I believe, are doing some. So again, if you want to learn more. But again, a lot of people are worried about cicadas, but this has happened for millennia, OK? And in fact, what we should do is really enjoy with this natural phenomenon that doesn't exist in most parts of the world. It only exists in some parts of the US. And we're in one of the largest broods, what they call brood 10. We are going to experience a natural phenomenon that you can only experience, I guess, on, on, on some TV shows, something that no one else can. Awesome. Thank you again, Alonzo. Again, I've, I've collected the questions. Uh, I'll have Alonzo answer those and, and we'll send them out following this. So one more virtual uh, round of applause for Alonzo and his presentation and enthusiasm. Uh, and then I will kick it over to Eleanor, who will introduce uh, one of our outgoing board members. Thank you so very much, Alonzo. Um, I think people, you are a legend. <laughs> We're glad we could have you. You're too kind. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker. Um, so our student board member for the past three years is now a senior at Yorktown High School, Alexa Gramada. Um, it's just been a pleasure to work, work with Alexa. Um, I valued seeing her grow as a leader in her school and in Arlington Public Schools. She serves with me on the Arlington Public School Sustainability Advisory Committee that reports to Dr. Duran. And um, we're here to hear Alexa's mission moment to talk about how Eco Action Arlington has affected her life. So thank you, Alexa. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexa. I'm Alexa and I'm officially a former student board member of Eco Action Arlington. My journey with Eco Action Arlington began when I was in elementary school and I would help my dad pass out free trees at Taylor Elementary School Spring Fair. I have a strong passion for the environment um, starting at a very young age. I, um, I went to Jamestown Elementary School where we were exposed to a regular farm to table program and each student was given a tree to plant in at each student's own yard. This helped me um, spark my interest in preserving the environment for future generations. When I first joined the board as a timid high schooler, I assumed achieving environmental goals would be relatively easy. Who wouldn't support efforts to recycle and save our planet? I soon learned all the hurdles that can get in the way of progress and the environmental education needed to make a real difference. As a result of being on this board, I was fortunate enough to be appointed to the Superintendent's Advisory Committee for Sustainability. Being on this committee helped me understand the sustainability objectives and initiatives focused on the school system. As a result of my experience of being a part of both of these organizations, I decided to focus my senior year AP Biology Independent Science Project on the environmental impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on our school system's buildings. Leveraging contacts on this board and the sustainability committee, I used data as well as expertise I gathered from talking to members to analyze the environmental impacts of different school attendance modes on um, due to the pandemic. When I presented this project, my classmates and teachers were amazed. They were so intrigued, some reached out to me after I presented this project and asked me questions and to find out more information. They were so um, amazed and they, they thought about this for a while. And um, this project reminded me again of my unique position on this board. Not only have I learned so much by participating in monthly board meetings, as well as volunteer activities, but I've had the opportunity to be a bridge to my peers in my school and in my community to share the board's initiatives and goals. At the beginning of my term, I must admit, I was pretty intimidated by the knowledge and years of experience of various members of the Eco Action Arlington board. Through the monthly board meetings, as well as volunteer activities, I got to know individual board members much better, and I quickly realized their interest in my perspective as a student was genuine. I felt more confident in participating in meetings and making suggestions and giving feedback. I want to thank everyone for being so welcoming and helpful to me when I joined the board and during my term. I always looked forward to our meetings and events, and I feel so lucky to have had this opportunity and to have worked with such motivated, compassionate, dedicated members of this community. I know I'll carry the lessons learned from this experience and hope to continue to make an impact and influence on my peers on the important issues of conservation, stewardship of our natural resources and living a more sustainable life. 
Thank you so much, Alexa. Um, if we could give her a round of applause. Um, it's been a thrill to have you on the board. Um, and we'll miss you and uh, all the best to you in your career. Um, I also wanted to share um, if anybody um, is connected with Arlington High School students, we do have openings um, for student board members. Um, so please uh, read our website where we have our board positions announced and let us know if um, you know of a student who may be interested. So we are about to um, have a stretch break. Following the stretch break will be our exhibits. Oops. So I wanted to briefly, um, before our stretch break, share what's going to be happening. So um, the exhibits will take place from 7.50 to 8.20. Um, after the exhibits, please come back. Um, we have the Nature's Best Hope Book uh, by Douglas Tallamy as a door prize, and we'll be awarding that at 8.20. Um, so we will open the 10 exhibits listed on your screen at uh, 7.50. Um, you will have the opportunity to visit any exhibit using the choose breakout room button that's on the bottom. Please don't worry if you can't get there, we will take care of you. Um, so again, uh, if it works for you, you should be able to choose your breakout room and then leave your breakout room to go to another room. Um, but if it doesn't work, um, uh, Michelle with Eco Action Arlington will be on hand. Um, and there's a couple of options to get you into a room of your choice. Um, so I've listed those here. So um, you can even start now. Um, if you'd like to um, rename yourself with the exhibit number of the room you want to join. Um, so for example, Seven Jane Butterfly, if you wanted to visit the Northwest Federal Credit Union. Or hang out. Um, verbally state your name and which room you want to visit. So you would say, Eleanor, I want to go to three, Capital Nature, and Michelle, will, and, Michelle and I will take care of you. So I will leave uh, these instructions up. Uh, so we will have our stretch break now, and then please come back at 7.50. Enjoy these many ex amazing exhibitors, and we're really, really thankful to have each and every one of them and then come back at 8.20 so we can wrap up the program and pick our door prize winner. All right, well, thank you so much. I wanted to um, take a moment to pause and uh, reflect on nature, which was our theme for this evening. And I'm uh, very grateful for um, Arlington and its many streams and parks um, that I've enjoyed over this past year, as I think many of us are. Uh, so we're um, thrilled we could celebrate the wonderful nature of Arlington, highlight all the many, many wonderful organizations who are here to that we can all join and volunteer with um, to help uh, with our mission to preserve these wonderful spaces um, and keep it for future generations. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, both our featured speaker, Alonzo Abogadis, um, the moderator, Chris Baumgartner, uh, Matt DeFerrante, and Alexa Gramada. Um, in a minute, I will uh, pick the door prize winner uh, for the book. And, uh, but before I did that, I also wanted to say that we do, Eco Action Arlington does depend on uh, generous donations of individuals like each of you. We thank all of the members who are already supporting us um, and welcome uh, those of you who joined um, as new members tonight. Um, starting in April, um, we will have our Earth Month Fundraising Challenge. And this is a, a big month for us um, that helps us raise the money that we need to continue to do our work to educate to engage, to teach the leaders of tomorrow and to advocate for the important policies we need to protect our air, water and open spaces. Uh, so I did wanna encourage you to um, please, if you can support us during um, our Earth Month fundraising challenge um, so we can continue um, our important mission. So um, I have my electronic hat, <laughs> so I'm gonna pick a name. Um, so the winner of the book, Nature's Hope, Best Hope by Douglas Tallamy is uh, Romana Campos.
Is Romana Campos here? Yay, Romana. If she's Romana, here. am I saying uh, it right? here? I'm Romana, here. yay, and I'm sorry, I think I said it wrong. wrong. Romana Campos. So Romana, if I, you could put your email in the chat, I will follow up and figure out a way to mail this book. You know, um, I just wanted to say, I, um, I saw Doug telling me and I, I'm, I'm actually, I bought his book, I'm reading the book. So I would love to have someone else be able to get that book. Oh, okay. Let me go to my second, my, my virtual hat. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and I, I appreciate I never win anything, but I just want to share that. Keep that book going. <laughs> Thank you. All right. How about uh -huh. um, Chris Herrick? Um, yes, I'm here. All Yay. Right. Congratulations, Chris. All right. Wow. So you're the winner of the book. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. Congratulations. Um, if you could just, I think we have your email, but if you could also make sure that you put it in the chat, um, we will. If if I could add one more thing, yeah, I'll, actually be, I'll be actually be doing interviewing him as part of the Native Plant pod, uh, podcast at the end of the month. And I'll be happy to share once that once the uh, once the interview goes through. But I'm very lucky. He just wrote the book on, on oaks and that's what we're going to be interviewing him on and so forth. So in closing, um, so thank you, Alonzo. Um, we, Alonzo was busy um, answering a lot of your questions in the chat. We will do our best to get the transcript of that um, to everybody um, so you can read some of his answers. Thank you, Alonzo, for taking that extra time. We also have all of Alonzo's slides um, and not one, but two videos that we weren't able to show tonight. Um, the Magnolia Bog video that we had some technical difficulties with, as well as a link to a Capital Naturalist um, fun Fox uh, Vixens video. So we will send all of this out via email um, in the next couple of days. Um, and lastly, this uh, meeting has been recorded. Um, so we, uh, if you know somebody who didn't, um, wasn't able to be here tonight, we will share it. <laughs> people can watch it online. So thank you again. Um, congratulations to our brand new 2021 board members. And we look forward to seeing each and every one of you at future programs. So have a great night.